Today, we're happy to have Dr. Ed Finn, Director of the Center for Science and Imagination with Arizona State University here with us today for a discussion on harnessing imagination for resilience. Feel free to jump in anytime with questions you have, but we'll also have some time at the end for discussion and follow up. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Dr. Finn. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you all today. Can you all see my screen now? Hopefully so. Um, today, I'd like to talk about imagination, not just as an abstract concept, but as a method and a tool. I'll be offering a few examples from our work at the Center for Science and the Imagination and what we've learned from our experiences, and then hopefully bringing in how I think that might be relevant to healthcare and health sciences. So first, this question, what is imagination? If you ask a physicist, a writer, a boxer, what is central to their work, they might well tell you that imagination is central. And if you ask Albert Einstein, Muhammad Ali, or Adrienne Marie Brown, that is exactly what they'd say. Uh, imagination, to fill out the Einstein quote, is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there will ever be to know and understand. But interestingly, nobody quite knows what imagination is. We only really pay attention to imagination when it goes missing. You've probably heard that phrase, failures of imagination. Uh, September 11th, or our national response to this pandemic, remind us how vital it is to value and empower our collective imagination to make space for people to think about the broader picture, to make connections, uh, and to think of one another, to learn how to listen to one another. So I want to offer my working definition of imagination, which is that it is the ignition system for foresight, empathy, and resilience. Imagination is a cognitive capacity that everybody has. Uh, we think about it, we celebrate imagination in little kids, and then we pound it out of them through years of formal education. And then we turn around when they're adults and say, well, why aren't you more imaginative? Why are we having these failures? Why you, can't you be more like Margaret Atwood or Steve Jobs? So we catch glimpses of it and we recognize it when it's missing, but most of the time it's a little bit like electricity. It's this faculty that we're using without even thinking about it and often we're letting it use us. So if you think about all of our anxieties and fears, the ways in which we can get swayed by other people's visions of the future or, or of who we are, sometimes to our detriment, uh, imagination is constantly working uh, but it's all not necessarily something that's working for us as individuals or communities. So there are fields that look at these questions in more constrained ways. If you think about neuroscience or behavioral economics or even philosophy, uh, the arts and poetry all have uh, frames and arguments about what imagination is and how it works. But I don't think that any of them really approach it uh, at this foundational level and certainly not as the precursor to all of the stuff that we, we do try to measure and pay attention to, uh, including creativity and innovation. Um, so when you think about imagination in that context of foresight, empathy, and resilience, these are really key defining features of, of this human species and of our, of our collective capacity to, to do things. So foresight, anticipating what might happen, planning ahead, empathy, imagining the lives of other people, putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes, uh, and resilience, learning to adapt and change based on our environment, based on our observations, uh, based on our, our modeling of what other people might do. Um, and th these are really the core skills, fundamental skills that we're going to need to navigate all of the challenges of the 21st century. So I want to turn now to talk a little bit about the uh, work we do at the Center for Science of the Imagination. Uh, I founded it at ASU in 2012, and our mission is to inspire collective imagination for a better future. And for the first uh, eight years now, it was, it was pretty productive not to define imagination and just to do a bunch of work. And as we've matured and we've established ourselves and we've defined now this body of, of research and practice around the things that we care about, it's becoming increasingly clear to me that we need to start having this conversation about imagination itself as a, as a field, as a, an area of inquiry, and as a kind of toolkit for all of these other things that we so desperately need and we need to make more visible. So 
when we started the center, we started with this fundamental thesis that stories are the building blocks we use to make the future. Um, indeed, stories are the building blocks we use to navigate reality in general. We're natural storytellers. Uh, we use them, we share them, and we, we use them to shape culture. They're how we transmit knowledge. They're how we inspire people. We're all constantly narrating a story about ourselves, who you are right now, sitting there looking at the screen, uh, who, what you're going to do next. And of course, we discard most of the information that comes in from our senses. Uh, we, we can't process all of it. We throw most of it away. Most of it away. We stitch little bits of it together into this ongoing narrative. And a lot of the challenges we face are when we need to rewrite our narrative. Or we need to confront a reality that diverges from the story that we want to tell. One of our collaborators, the science fiction writer Neil Stevenson, once argued that a good story can save you a thousand hours in PowerPoint slides because if you can get everybody on the same page around a vision of the future, then they can coordinate and figure out the rest on their own, right? That there's a power in the collaborative imagination that stories can, um, can underwrite. So stories can provide not just the, uh, the, the one big idea, but a whole world and a microcosm, right? A story is almost like an MP3 file that you can un unpack, uh, un decompress to create an entire imaginative space in your head. So it's a very inexpensive form of uh, a very expensive, inexpensive laboratory for different kinds of speculation about things we might try. If you think about the scientific method and scientific process, a lot of it is about using imagination, uh, trying to anticipate challenges, trying to understand the world in new ways. So uh, you, we can trace this feedback loop. Imagination is the power source or the mental holodeck, if you will, that enables writers to create stories, but that also inspires researchers to respond to those ideas. Imagination provides a shared language for foresight. It creates iconic ideas. Some of those classics from science fiction that are not so science fictional anymore, like the robot or the rocket ship or the submarine. And there is a very strong connection, right, but the, between those, uh, those visions, those stories we tell about the future and things that we've actually made. Those stories are not predictions. They're waypoints in a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue between our collective imagination of what we think the world should be and our technical achievements. The stories can help us set the targets, ask the questions, sometimes guess at the answers. But as you can tell from these pictures, and if you think about the way in which historically we've conceived of science fiction and science fictional representations of the future, it's a pretty small subset of people who feel empowered and invited to imagine those futures. If you think about the people who are imagining the future today who are really shaping the future in powerful ways, there's a tiny group of people in Silicon Valley who are making a lot of those decisions. Uh, they're relatively small percentages of the overall population who, who really have any kind of um, investment or uh, invitation to, to imagine the future in a rich and compelling way. And it's becoming increasingly clear that that's not working for all of us, that we need to create more inclusive futures, more inspiring futures. And we need to stop thinking about our relationship with the future as monolithic or somebody else's problem or hopeless, which are all very common reactions today when people think about the future, especially in this year, 2020. So how do you foster imagination? How do you actually do it? I'd like to share three projects that we have worked on that provide three insights into what you might call the praxis of collective imagination. So the first example it illustrates how you support blue sky expansive thinking while still grounding that work in technical possibility. And what we have done at the center, this was one of our early focus areas, was how do we tell exciting, inspiring stories about the future that could actually become real, that are connected to current research, uh, scientific knowledge, technical expertise. So uh, this is one project that explores that uh, that goal, uh, this is a, a project in collaboration with NASA to explore the new future of space exploration and commercialization. So we got a group of science fiction writers together with space scientists and also, also social scientists and experts in fields like economics, history, uh, psychology, and, we, and also artists. Um, and we asked them all to work together 
around the near future of space exploration and commercialization. And the central question that was animating this project was, technically, we know how to go to space. We've known how to go to space since the 1960s. The question now really becomes why? Why are we going to go? Who gets to go? How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to justify and, uh, and cope with the risk of space exploration, and especially as we transition from the frame of exploration, which involves serious risks, to commercial activity, things like, and even things like tourism or visiting space, the democratization of space, which has a very different relationship to risk. So just one example of, of these stories, which explored uh, Mars, uh, asteroids and resource extraction, low Earth orbit, uh, and exoplanets. Um, there's a story by Madeline Ashby titled Death on Mars that explored how we might handle uh, patient privacy and decisions about the end of life when that patient is an astronaut bound for Mars. I heard a noise. Was there a question? No. OK. Um, so. Uh, really interesting juxtaposition, right? That when you're thinking about space, the, my, my big takeaway from this project was that we need to think of space as a canvas for human exploration. And it becomes, especially when you're talking about commercial activity, NASA has this um, almost, almost like a, a, a ring that they think of as their area of exploration activity. And that's getting wider and wider. And then behind that, there's this space where other people are going to start doing stuff, commercial activity, tourism, and NASA is going to keep pushing the, the far envelope, go to that far horizon. But there's going to be all of this other stuff that happens. And that other stuff is, you know, healthcare, it's psychology, it's human relationships and community, it's education. So starting to think about all of these other things that will happen in space if we start to make space a human arena is a nice example of how collective imagination can lead you to new and surprising conversations. And it turns out uh, the, the, this uh, Madeline Ashby talked to a number of people at NASA. NASA unsurprisingly has very carefully elaborated policies and has done, done a lot of thinking about healthcare in space and also potentially fatal illnesses in space. Uh, the privacy of astronauts in space and how that's balanced with the needs of, of a mission. Uh, so a really fascinating set of issues that all got pulled into that story. The second lesson I'll talk about is inclusive storytelling. So how do we inspire our audience to start imagining their own futures, inviting them to see, uh, inviting them in to see our work, not just as entertainment or something that we're broadcasting out to them, but as an invitation to participate and engage in a more meaningful way. And this is always a challenge with uh, communications, science communication, engaging the public in research. I think it's especially challenging when we're talking about the stakes of imagination, because when you're just sharing new technological developments, new scientific advances, you're already boxing out a lot of that imagination work and saying, well, that's all been settled. These are the things that are important. We're just going to give you our final report on what's new, what's happening, what we've developed or built. So we decided to go backwards, to go forwards. Uh, this is a project called Frankenstein 200 that used the bicentennial of Mary Shelley's novel as a launching pad to explore scientific creativity oops, and responsibility today. So this is a story that everyone knows. It feels very comfortable reinventing from Halloween costumes and internet memes to lunch boxes and breakfast cereals. Even if you've never heard of Mary Shelley, you know this story of the scientist who creates a creature and then uh, fails, to, fails to take responsibility for his actions. So in our approach to this, we worked with a target audience of 13 to 18 year olds and we connected this modern myth to debates around emerging technologies like synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, and robotics with three central questions. And one of the wonderful things about these questions is, while well, that was our primary audience was in that teen range, we also worked with families who had kids as young as four or five, all the way up to grandparents. And these questions could productively engage an entire family and engage the family in a really compelling discussion. So what we did for the project was studied how participating in our activities enhanced science self-efficacy. We worked with a network of 51 different science centers and museums nationally, and we deployed activities that involved making, collaboration, 
hands-on exploration of these themes. One of my very favorites was asking individuals or families to create a little robot using a piece of a, a pool noodle and some markers and rubber bands, and then you would put an electric toothbrush motor into the top. And so all of a sudden you had, and you would, you would name your robot and you would give it some googly eyes and feathers and give it some personality and, and uh, then you would turn it on and it would start to draw stuff. And these questions about um, our, our three animating questions became really powerful. If you said, well, your, your creature here has just made this incredibly valuable work of art and somebody wants to buy it for a million dollars. Who gets to keep the money? Do you get to keep the money or is this, does your creature get to keep that money? Um, and then the inverse of that question is, oh dear, your creature has drawn on something really important. It's drawn on this copy of the US Constitution and somebody is in a lot of trouble. Whose fault is this? Is this your fault or is this your creature's fault? Uh, and uh, unsurprisingly, people were more interested in taking the money than they were in taking responsibility if, the, if their creature did something bad. Uh, but these were debates that could engage everybody from kindergarten to, uh, to full adulthood. So, Another part of this project was we developed an alternate reality game to explore some of the central lessons of Frankenstein in a contemporary setting. So I'll let Dr. Victoria Frankenstein explain that one herself. Oh, tell Igor to set up a call with Professor Nakashima, please. Oh, hello. I'm Dr. Tori Frankenstein. And this is LIFE, the Frankenstein Laboratory for Innovation and Fantastical Exploration. You probably recognize my name. I'm the fifth generation of scientists in the Frankenstein family. Sometimes with a name like Frankenstein, it's difficult to be taken seriously, thanks to that book. But here at LIFE Lab, I've decided to embrace my legacy. We're devoted to exploration. Exploring what makes us human whether it's our biology or our culture. And we're looking for people, especially young people who are curious, people who like to do things, make things, ask questions. And we've partnered with 50 science museums around the nation. We know that you have busy lives, so we won't take much of your time. We'll just ask that you check in every three days or so for 30 days of science and maybe a kind of frank adventure. Sign up at Frankenstein.life to start the experience. So that project was tremendous fun. And we spent a lot of time talking about how to get into these questions without just making Frankenstein into a cautionary tale or an anti-science tale. I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. But I think we struck a good balance to really get students to take on the persona or participants to take on the persona of a scientist and explore these questions for themselves. So my last little uh, insight I'll share from our work is the practice of world building. How can we create experiences of the future that are more immersive, more visceral, that invite different kinds of direct engagement and participation where you can help to imagine something that feels very real and that invites very different practices of imagination, physical embodied forms of imagination. So uh, in 2018, I think it was, uh, we created Luna City, an instantiation of Emerge, which is an annual art science festival we help organize each spring at ASU. Uh, so in 2018, this was a richly detailed immersive experience of what it might be like to visit a neighborhood in a city on the moon. So, and this video I'll play here, you can see that this was a project that involved uh, well over 100 people working for several months in a multi-stage collaboration that began with a very intensive uh, workshop-driven collaborative world building process where we made all of the important decisions about where in the solar system we would be, what year it would be, what our timeline would be like from today to this future, and started to ask some of the same questions from our, our uh, NASA space project, who gets to go? What, why do people go to space? What is it like to actually live there, to dwell there?
came to Arizona State last fall to help a team here that was developing a interesting project to model and fabricate a moon base. What would it be like and why would you do it and what would the ramifications be? In the Luna City that I visited there were several things that I loved and then but far more the sociality was quite beautiful. So I came to Luna City and it is so different. You know, we do not have things such as government or focus on wealth. We don't have currency and such. And it's very um, open and it's very supportive. So, synthesizing across these projects and a number of our other efforts in uh, eight years now of, of these kinds of activities, I want to share a framework that we started to, to develop, thinking about imagination and collaborative imagination as a kind of toolkit and doing a, an assessment of uh, case studies of, of some of our own projects. Here are three central areas where we identified things that, um, that are really impo important to focus on in terms of methodology. So first is creating the conditions for imagination. So uh, when we think about bringing people together in workshops or narrative hackathons or other kinds of collaborative gathering uh, uh, activities, uh, structuring time, identifying the right group of people to participate, uh, staging a physical space that is conducive to uh, a, a uh, collaboration. Um, I am thinking about the aesthetics of the project, everything from how you communicate, how you make that first invitation, to the materials that you're using. Uh, we often like to send little care packages or uh, uh, other content ahead of time to cue people and to show care, to show empathy, to model empathy and to, to model interest uh, and to invite people uh, to approach this as something special and distinctive rather than just another uh, part of their day. Um, and also to model optimism. When, when we say optimism, it doesn't mean that we think everything's going to be great, but uh, we, we, call, we think of thoughtful optimism, the idea that if we collectively work on imagining better futures, we can make the future better. We can work towards more positive outcomes. But an important part of that is exploring what and debating and discussing what positive outcomes are, what they actually look like. Uh, it's remarkable how much of the time, how much of our imaginative capacity is dedicated to freaking out about all the bad things that could happen, uh, but not actually figuring out what we do want to happen and talking about how we can work towards it. It's much easier to be a critic than it is to advance a positive vision of the future that you want to build. So a second category here, defining processes. Uh, a lot of our work asks people to let go of the idea of perfection, uh, to let go of disciplinary models that they might be comfortable with and to try something new and to try something with someone new that they they maybe have never worked with before or uh, to use a new kind of process or create something that they've never tried to create before. So a mix of wide open blue sky challenge and creative constraints. Maybe you can create any kind of a world you want, but you only have 30 minutes, get ready, go. Uh, and to identify very concrete goals to scaffold that kind of engagement and activity so people know uh, what they have to create. Maybe you're creating a world, but you are answering these four questions in this template as you're scaffolding to do that. And of course, to facilitate these activities to help guide people so that they don't become lost or to, again, feel like they're cut off or on their own. And then finally, uh, how do you shape the outputs? How do you 
curate the work itself? How do you make the work better? Um, so for us thinking about narrative, again, from the beginning of my talk is really important. How do we create visions of the future that will translate beyond the people in the room so that they will be compelling stories, they will be inspiring to others. So that is do the craft of storytelling. It's about using visual imagery. It's about thinking about uh, different platforms and channels for public engagement. We have various media partnerships and friends and allies in different parts of the, not just academia, but beyond academia and different public sectors that we work with to share our ideas. Um, we focus on how we can continually focus on how we can make our process, own processes better. Um, and ultimately, this notion of building imaginative capacity is something we take very seriously, that all of our activities, the really the primary output, in fact, is not, is not the work product that we're creating. It's not the collection of science fiction stories about space exploration or uh, the, uh, it's not the Luna City experience. It's actually inspiring and sharing these, these techniques with a group of people who, who participated in the project, who were the audiences of that project, and thinking about that, that cultivating an expansion of imaginative capacity as, as uh, our, one of our primary goals in every project that we do. So what does this have to do with healthcare? I think it has quite a lot to do with healthcare. I want to come back to our, my, my definition of imagination. Who do we call on for foresight, for empathy and resilience more than almost anyone else? Doctors, nurses, and other providers of care. So I am very interested in thinking about how we start to bring our work to new audiences and new collaborators. Uh, we've started to advance a few projects and a few ideas uh, that connect this notion of imagination and uh, I'm framing imaginative resilience uh, that connects to healthcare. So we're developing ideas for a pilot right now to work with pre-service nursing students to develop imaginative practices to build their own resilience. There's quite a bit of research on the challenges that nurse practitioners face um, and the, the challenges of resilience in, the, in those positions, uh, high rates of burnout, uh, higher than average rates of suicide, other challenges. Um, and I think uh, many of those challenges apply to other uh, people in the line of service in, in healthcare. Uh, so thinking about imagination, again, as this, um, this critical and fundamental capacity that underpins these other things that we do, that people have been starting to pay more attention to, like resilience. Um, another area where we're uh, working to develop uh, some pilot projects is uh, working with high school students from underserved populations to pair uh, to, to pair them up or to place them in health science internships, but pair that internship with creative writing internship to imagine their own health futures. So they would engage in uh, a summer internship at, say, the Mayo Clinic, um, but they would also be working with a writing coach and writing a science fiction story that features themselves as a character to imagine a health future that they are in, that someone uh, with their background, uh, who looks like them, who uh, who, who knows what they know can be part of this future and to build that imaginative capacity of setting the target and, and working towards something that they'd like to work towards. Um, as we move forward, I'm really excited to start building new connections and new conversations around imagination uh, more broadly. I think that the, the pandemic, uh, the, the ways in which our lives have been so disrupted and changed um, have been uh, a crisis, but also an opportunity to reflect on how we connect to one another, uh, how we build our resilience, how this uh, remarkably, uh, how powerfully the, the tragedies of COVID-19 have also pushed us to be more empathetic, to make decisions in the service of, for the benefit of strangers in a way that uh, I've certainly never seen uh, in, in, uh, in my life in the United States. So really powerful, um, really powerful adaptations and new kinds of conversations that were simply not possible before. And I hope that we can also cultivate our capacity for foresight and to think about imaginative futures, not just as a, a national or a, a distant project or a project that is delegated to a small team of experts, but something that every community has to engage in. Um, I think that uh, as indeed the, the news uh, right now is showing us that 
uh, all of our crises are going to are going to happen at the same time, and we're going to need to contend with uh, the future, not just in terms of uh, uh, of, of health uh, and, and disease, we're going to need to think about climate change and adaptation. We're going to need to think about racial justice. We're going to need to think about um, uh, misinformation and disinformation. So uh, in all of these ways, we need to uh, start to build imaginative capacity, not just at the individual level, uh, and, or not just at some sort of macro uh, state or global level, but to think about imagination as a shared activity, something that we do together, something that we do in communities with our colleagues, and to start to empower communities and uh, local groups of people to start to imagine their own future in detailed, compelling, exciting ways that help them make decisions to work towards those futures that they would like to achieve. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Ed. We have time for discussion. Does anybody have any questions, anything they want to ask? You can also submit it in the chat um, if you don't have a good speaker and I can ask. Good afternoon, Ed, and hi, Caitlin. Uh, this is Anne-Marie Medina. I'm the uh, Director of Corporate and Community Relations for the Health Sciences at University of Arizona. Um, you talk about imagination. What would you say is one of the best tools to get uh, younger generations started on becoming imaginative? So I think that younger generations are already more deeply connected to their own imaginations. And when you think about little kids, they have not yet learned that some things aren't allowed or some things aren't impossible. They haven't had years of people telling them, oh, you can't do that, that's never gonna work, right? And so those capacities are there and play is one of the best pathways in, I think, to imagination. So inviting people to be playful, which can be uh, very simple and straightforward, uh, asking people to write a postcard from the future or write a postcard to their future self or to make a paper object and tell us a story about it. Um, to uh, sit, sit somewhere and, and uh, find a random stranger on the street and then start imagining what their life is like and narrating that person's life story. There are all these little exercises um, that can be very powerful uh, to start to unlock imaginative capacity. Um, and uh, I think as people grow older, there are various, you see uh, sort of improv and uh, when we ask people to take on roles and perform as someone else, that can sometimes be a way in which people feel a little bit more free to, to do something that they wouldn't do as themselves. Uh, this is another reason why uh, telling stories is so effective because uh, you can have a debate about uh, racism or healthcare or uh, economic inequality in a science fiction story in a way that you can't about real life because the story is fiction and people feel much more comfortable sharing their ideas or even taking on new positions or trying out something that they would never say, you know, in real life uh, through the lens of a science fiction story uh, or really any kind of story. It doesn't have to be said in the future. Um, so those are all ways in which uh, you can start to unlock imaginative capacity. Um, I think the real challenge is helping people feel um, safe and empowered to take those creative risks, to be imaginative. And I think that uh, those processes, that slide I was showing before, before, creating the conditions in which people feel safe doing that, it, it can be really challenging. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Uh, your comments about uh, making it a safe space, I think is really what's key, especially for adults. Not, you know, children tend to be much more open, but, you know, for adults to be able to freely say what they need to. So I like the idea of the, doing it in science fiction or something like that. So thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I actually had a quick question too, Ed. I was hoping you could expand a bit on, you mentioned that you could talk about it in this time, how you coped with Frankenstein being such a used all the time as a cautionary tale against science to using it to something to encourage imagination in the sciences? That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, so what we uh, decided, and what, th there, are, there are a number of ways to read Frankenstein, but I think that uh, you can make a very compelling argument that Victor Frankenstein's real crime in the novel is not 
his decision to uh, to to bring this this creature to life to create a new form of life, his real crime is then taking no responsibility for his actions and abandoning this experiment as soon as he as soon as he completed it. Uh, and to his he also he was a sort of a crime of a lack of imagination. He failed to anticipate what was going to happen, and he failed to he he failed to have any empathy for this creature. Uh, and so he failed in his own responsibility as a as a creator and a uh, uh, and and a kind of parent to this creature. Um, and uh, fascinatingly, Victor Frankenstein and the novel predate the first use of the word scientist by almost twenty years. So before we had the the figure of the scientist, we had the figure of Victor Frankenstein. And I think the figure of Dr. Frankenstein continues to haunt science today. If you think about Franken food, Franken fish. You know, we've we've so shorthanded it that we've made it into a prefix, right? And so there is this real stigma uh, around the sort of uh, this is a, ter a terrible Frankenstein word, the Frankensteinization of science. So we we thought a lot about that, but we think that there is a, a really powerful reading of the story about scientific creativity and responsibility, and uh, that Victor Frankenstein was still a very flawed protagonist and made many mistakes, but his big mistake was around this notion of responsibility. Um, and so that became a good lens for our alternate reality game, where you become, as a young person, an intern in, in Tori Frankenstein's laboratory. Uh, and you, so you're, per, you're performing, you're taking on the persona of a young scientist, and you're engaging with these other frame characters who are young scientists as well. They're uh, sort of research assistants in the lab, but then you have to confront this ethical dilemma that Victoria Frankenstein has done something um, very morally questionable, and you have to decide whose side you're going to be on. If you're going to basically validate her choice in, in, in performing an, effectively an experiment without, uh, without getting prior consent, uh, or if you're going to reject that and basically you sort of you know, call call her on that decision and 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 make sure that she faces the consequences for it. Um, thank you so much for saying. It looks like we have a hand raised. Uh, Kaylee, do you have a question you want to ask? Yeah, definitely. I really enjoyed um, your talk, and I I teach in science, and I work with interns um, in nutrition and dietetics. So I I, I really like the thought of trying to bring some of the interplay of, of writing and imagination in, into what they're learning. And I do a little bit of that anyways, and I think they kind of hate me sometimes because I want them to write reflections on everything, um, especially since I teach online, it helps me get to know them a little bit better. So I was wondering if you had any um, references maybe for some non-traditional sort of reflection, like, um, prompts to get them thinking a little bit away from like, this is what I did this week in my internship, this is what I learned, to maybe put a little bit more of a skew of the imagination to it? Um, that's a great question too. I would think about asking them to um, step outside of themselves a little bit. So one might be, um, what's, the, what's the one thing you're going to remember about this, this week 10 years from now, right? Which is a, uh, a, a perspective shift or a temporal shift, or uh, you know, again, reversing that to say, okay, you're, you, th this reflection is going to get buried in a time capsule, and we're going to open it 50 years from now. What what does somebody 50 years from now need to know about what's been happening with you in, in your your life? Um, another way to do this is to think about. Um, uh, a, a shift following that empathy axis to say, well, what if you wrote your reflection this week from somebody else's perspective, maybe a patient or a colleague that you were interacting with. Um, and it could be, and then, you know, it could be a reflection of how you think they feel and what they're doing, or it could be, how do you think, what, what do they think about you and how you're doing, right? But that could be another way to make it more interesting. Um, and then uh, you can always consider um, introducing fictional elements, you know, which could be, um, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, what, what, what th this week your reflection imagines that the, 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 the tricorder from Star Trek exists. Um, you know, how does that change your, how does it change what you're doing every day? Um, or maybe you take something away, right? Um, this week you're going to imagine doing your, your job, but there's no electricity. Um, so uh, I think, uh, and, and, you know, another, another, uh, 
we, so we, I didn't mention this. We did this series over the over the summer. One of our responses to the pandemic was we st we we ran a, a series of uh, very short stories, microfiction stories, and conversations called "Us in Flux," which were about resilience and imagination. And they weren't specifically about pandemics, um, but they were about how uh, how do we, how we adapt, how we are resilient as individuals and communities. Um, and one of the stories from that was uh, a really nice little writing exercise that was just a very intimate attempt to detail everything that was happening outside of this writer's window on, on their balcony. Um, and uh, which was inspired by, um, it might've been Georges Perec, a, a French writer from maybe the, the 60s or 70s who tried to document everything that happened in a busy uh, Parisian square sitting at a cafe table one day. And these are actually, no matter how small you make that frame, it's still an impossible project, right? The world is so full of detail and activity uh, that you can't capture that. But asking your reflection writers to focus on something really small can still make them see their work and their lives in a, in a new way because you realize how how much there is even in the tiniest microcosm, the a single moment of, of our lives. Thank you, that was really great. I appreciate it. No problem. All right, we got a question in the chat from uh, Catherine Reed, so I'll read that to you, Ed. It says, I like the idea of looking at how the disruption of the pandemic and the vivid surfacing of racism can present opportunities to reshape social norms for the better, I hope. Are you aware of who is reimagining and how they can tell these new stories? Yeah, we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about that and uh, trying to uh, build diverse dialogues in the things that we do. But uh, I think that that's really important. That's really important work that, and there's much, much more work that needs to be done there. I'm thinking about who feels empowered to imagine futures, who gets to participate in those conversations. Um, one uh, a really uh, compelling book I read this summer on that is called Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Here, I think I've got it right here, actually. Um, and she uses, and one of the reasons I was excited about this is that she uses the keyword imagination a lot. She actually says we are in an imagination battle. And she talks about the power of imagination and speculative fiction to open up new possibilities for um, what we might do. And she is, in addition to being a an author, she is a, a, a social justice activist and uh, has a lot of experience in different uh, kinds of, of community organizing and public dialogue. Um, so, you know, there are people out there who have been thinking about this for a long time. She's also part of this, um, I think it's called the Octavia Butler Legacy or Octavia Butler's Legacy Network, and they do um, various workshops and activities. So, uh, you know, I think that the the, 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 the sea change around uh, George Floyd's murder and, and uh, all of the protests and, and uh, dialogue around systemic racism in the past few months have also been a big imaginative shift. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to think about that in conjunction with the, pen, the COVID-19 pandemic and recognize that our imaginative structures of thought can change just like other, other things can change, just like our political structures can change or our economic structures can change. But um, just like those other things, they're so massive and so pervasive that it's, it can be very difficult to imagine other possible worlds until you actually see it happen. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, this, this is Dr. Nikolic. I'm, I'm, I'm posing here as Lori because she made the appointment. I'm the chair of immunobiology. Um, and I wanted to bring up, um, you know, you were talking about making it safe for imagination. So, um, and I'm a chair of a basic science department in the College of Medicine. And it's kind of like our, our job to imagine things and be innovative. But, you know, one of the things that uh, frustrated me countless times is that, um, you know, scientists, just like everybody else, uh, love to cling to dogmas. And um, it's very disheartening to see, particularly in the review panels, where somebody comes up with a really cool, innovative idea, and somebody comes up trying to explain why should that not be possible and why they should be doing something a whole lot more pedestrian and boring and whatever. Um, 
obviously we cannot control everybody, but you know, we, we should be able to control a little bit of our own environment. Um, in terms of encouraging faculty as well as trainees to, to, to take that path, um, is there anything that you, that you can you know, recommend as a resource and or would you be willing to make a presentation of this type for, for the departments, groups of departments or individual departments that might be interested? Um, sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, so uh, as I said before, one of our primary outputs we think of is as maybe as, as changing the perceptions or opening up new possibilities for the people who participate and collaborate in some of our projects. And especially early on, we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we get scientists and engineers to do these weird things with us and take some of these risks. And uh, there are no uh, magic you know, answers to that, but framing the right kind of invitation and finding, thinking about what the intrinsic motivation for that is, is the only way to do it. Intrinsic motivation is the only way you're going to get a busy uh, scientist or an engineer to do anything, right? Um, we're not going to tempt them with uh, money or, or, or whatever. So, uh, so you know, presumably they went into their profession for that reason. <laughs> that's right, right. So you have to find that, right? You have to tap into that that fundamental uh, curiosity and excitement, and and also to so and I you know another part of this is uh, storytelling is very important. Uh, I came come from a humanities background, and one of my my little epiphanies, having never written any grants or you know done any kind of uh, sponsored research work before coming to ASU, and then being in a position where I'm now doing a lot of that. I recognize that the grant proposal is its own very bizarre subgenre of science fiction, and you are telling a story about a future that you'd like to realize in, in these proposals. And it matters how well you can tell that story. And if you can tell that story in a compelling way, you can convince the skeptics or you can get someone to maybe lay down their dogma, um, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, and so scientists need to be storytellers too, right? They need to be ready to, um, to advocate for their work outside of their discipline uh, in a broader way. And so asking people from different fields to collaborate and work with say, you know, storytellers, science fiction writers um, can be very powerful and starting to, to it, we, we, we try not to uh, put everybody into specialist boxes say, you're the writer, you're the expert, you're the artist, we want everybody to work together and when you 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 know I, we we do we visit the uh, freshman some of the freshman engineering classes at ASU and many times we've heard these engineers say oh I didn't know I was allowed to do that I didn't know I was allowed to write a science fiction story right so that's what you have to get over um, and I think the 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 first important step is to is to make the invitation and it has to be a thoughtful invitation that um, that is a that that speaks to those intrinsic motivations in a, in a compelling way. But yeah, you know, happy to, to talk more about. Um, sure, and if you could also uh, make available your slide deck, that would be useful too. You can send um, sure. Or, yeah. You know. Thanks. Great. Well, Ed, thank you so much for your time today and thank you so much for your presentation. For everybody that attended, we did record this session. So by the end of the week, it's gonna be archived on YouTube as well, on the University of Arizona Health Sciences YouTube. and. Um, with Ed's permission, if I get those slides, I'll send them out to everybody that attended as awesome. well. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks for great questions.